Thank you for the songs this morning, Art. I appreciated the theme of love. That's something I feel that we probably don't emphasize quite as much as we should sometimes, so I really did appreciate that. Also, like this last song that we sang, Holy is the Lord. It's looking at God's kingdom, and we've been looking at how the, earth, how the Christian relates to earthly kingdoms here, and it's so different. We praise him, the watchman, um, his kingdom is going to destroy sin and death. And all efforts that earthly kingdoms make to destroy sin and death and all the bad things around us just don't work out so well. But God's kingdom will succeed. Last time we looked at God's institution of government in the Old Testament. And we talked about how government is ordained by God. Government has fallen with mankind. Government is a thermometer of the condition of society. Government accomplishes God's purposes, even when they're not doing it God's way. And government is accountable to God. So this morning we're going to move into the New Testament and what the New Testament says about Christians relating to participating in the government. In the New Testament, God definitely reinforces the role of the government. Romans talks about that. God set up the government to punish evil, to reward good, things like that. But there's a new concept that is introduced in the New Testament. And this concept of two kingdoms, and I just alluded to it a little bit before. There's the, you might call it separation of church and state, maybe. Jesus said, John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But, at, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this reason I have been bo- for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Pilate is asking Pilate's struggling to understand what Jesus is talking about. He says, He's a king, but my servants aren't fighting. I'm willing to go through this, being captured. And Jesus said, yes, I was born to be a king. And if politics were the solution, then Jesus would have allowed the Jews to make him king at the triumphal entry. That's what a lot of them wanted to do. Politics isn't the solution. Jesus said, Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So this is an upside-down kingdom, a kingdom that is dramatically different than anything else. Matthew 5, 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So these humble people, like a child, the poor in spirit, are the people that are really part of the kingdom. And you can't be part of earthly politics and have these traits. Earthly politics is about pride and prestige and power. There's one example from the Old Testament, too, where God did call people, his people, to be part of earthly kingdoms. You look at Moses and you think about it, how he grew up in the house of Pharaoh. He was the son, a son of Pharaoh's. He was adopted as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And let's think about it from the two perspectives that people in that day could have thought of it from. So the Jews wanted to be free. They were slaves. I don't know how much they knew about Moses or knew that he was in Pharaoh's house, but it would seem to me, I mean, letting my imagination run a little bit, that if I was a Jew under slavery, I'm like, But Moses is going to be Pharaoh. He's in line to be Pharaoh next. And when he's Pharaoh, then we're going to be freed. That's what I would would think. That's not what happened. The best that could have probably happened if he had become Pharaoh, maybe, maybe Moses would have integrated them into society and given them their freedoms. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted something completely different. He wanted to call them out of Egypt. And so... Instead of pursuing this earthly politics plan, Moses went off to the desert for 40 years and was a shepherd. And he had to learn a lot of humility, 
how to learn to listen to God. And he probably had a lot of time to meditate. And then he could accomplish God's plan in a way that no one could have anticipated. And, and we can perhaps throw stones at Moses for rash decisions as uh, for killing that person. And, but the, the Hebrews makes it clear that it was a step of faith for Moses to leave Egypt. And it was part of God's plan. Jesus said again, Matthew 20, 25, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great man exercise authority over them. It is not this way with you. Thank you, Titus. So Jesus' politics was apparently a lot the same as it is today. There's these levels of authority, and you exercise all the power and authority that you can get for your own benefit. I think you can say that Jesus makes it clear that it's completely separate. Now, there are a lot of really, really good-sounding arguments for Christians participating in government. And maybe I should start by defining what, what, I, what I would mean by participating in government. Uh, you know, maybe serving in elected positions, voting, I think is participating in government. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call participating in government maybe you know working as a government contractor or employee, although th there can be some issues with that. But really involving ourselves in the politics of, of government, local, national, state, whatever. So the first argument is, this country is getting so bad, we have to do something. And if the good people don't do anything, then just the bad people will be doing, doing things. That's fair. It's true. And yes, something does definitely need to be done, but that something isn't political invi involvement because God is going to accomplish his purposes even when things are bad. Just like that picture of Moses, it seemed like he was doing nothing compared to what he could have been doing. But God's, God's purposes still move forward. Number two, people say that Christians should use their political power to change society. And this has been tried over and over throughout history and, and our, our next sermon on this when we talk about Christianity and government today. We're going to go into some more stories about this, but I just want to touch on it briefly. If you look at the, the Great Awakening beginning in the early 1800s, it was a time of spiritual revival in the United States, and, and people's hearts did change for the good. There were revival meetings and a lot of things changed but one of the ways that people tried to make those changes was to pass better laws because that will make better people at least so they thought and there were a couple different things that they tried to change one was slavery one was alcohol and, and sort of related to this was women's rights as well and the, the campaign against slavery and against alcohol abuse was led by religious people and so much so that some of these religious people left go of their religion and just hung on to this cause to such a great extent that they even became violent about it. There was, you study about John Brown, there was a war practically, not the Civil War, but a, a, little, a little uprising trying to abolish slavery. Didn't go well. And, and yes, slavery was abolished, but it took the Civil War. And I don't think Christians trying to, pass laws to outlaw slavery was really the method that God would, would have had them use. And um, abolishing alcohol. We have the prohibition. I'm sure you've studied about it. And there was two groups that, that kind of led the charge of the, uh, against this. The Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League, they kind of led the charge against alcohol. It started with temperance, so let's not abuse alcohol. And then it kind of moved into just outlawing alcohol. And, and it seemed like, for whatever reason, women and preachers were the ones that, that led this, this movement a lot. And um, as I said, you know, women's right to vote, women's rights, otherwise were, were a part of this as well. And beginning in the, about the mid-1800s, states started individually 
outlawing alcohol sale and related businesses. I think Maine le led the charge on that. And in 1920, the 18th Amendment was ratified and it became the law of the land that no more alcohol. And here is something I found very, very fascinating. Uh, Billy Sunday in Norfolk, Virginia staged a funeral service for John Barleycorn or alcohol and um, in which the Christian animus against liquor trade was summed up. Goodbye, John, the revivalist said. The reign of tears is over. The slums will soon be only a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories and our jails into storehouses and corn cribs. Men will walk upright now. Women will smile. Children will laugh. And hell will be forever for rent. I don't know if any of you have read history, but does that sound like what actually happened? Well, let's just say that it didn't work that way. And any effort for Christians to change hearts by passing laws will end pretty similarly. Ironically, there was an exemption in the prohibition law that allowed churches to use it for communion. So these very churches who were campaigning to outlaw um, alcohol were uh, serving wine at communion services, some of them. And, well, I don't know much about this man. In Ireland, Theobald Matthew, he tried a different method to fight against the evils of alcohol abuse. And he went around the country and he preached and he encouraged people. He crusaded for temperance. And he asked people to pledge, stop drinking alcohol. And liquor consumption in Ireland dropped by 45%. To me, that's what Christians should be doing reaching out to people's hearts, living, in ex living a life that's an example. Kingdom Christians change people from the, outside, the inside out. If you look at the statistics during the prohibition, alcohol consumption definitely dropped quite a bit, but it continued to grow and grow and grow. It didn't change people. I'm sure it had some positive effects, perhaps, but people didn't change permanently. Another argument that we need to get involved in politics is that <clears throat> Christian leaders can make a Christian country. And during this same time, Great Awakening, or throughout the 1800s, was this concept of manifest destiny that God has destined the United States, this great Christian nation, to spread capitalism from sea to shining sea. And we have songs like America the Beautiful that tie this Christianity and our, this nation together. And um, I didn't take the time to look it up, but if, if you look in your Christian hymnals, you'll even find one song like that. It slipped in. Um, this, this great Christian nation in the Christian hymnal. I, it's in there. I, I I, I, spent, I looked for it and I couldn't find it. It's been a long time since I sang the song, but you will, you will find one of those. But this great manifest destiny that God has destined this great Christian nation to spread Christianity and love and truth and light all over the world, or at least for sure in North America, was the justification for chasing Indians off their lands. And... fighting wars of conquest with Mexico. And if we look at how God set up government in the Old Testament, he did allow for conquest and taking land. But what we really run into a tr problem is when we try to judge nations by Christianity or Christianity by what God said in the Old Testament about how nations should operate, Christians can't be participating in the role of government. And as the United States grew during this um, manifest destiny idea, this, this growth, growth, growth was just proof to them that God was on the side of the Americans and was facilitating their growth and was chasing these evil savages away. And it's just not, it's just not the truth. The United States government just isn't Christian, and no nation can be Christian. 
despite all that's said about the Christian beginnings of our country, 1796, so just a few years into the brand new United States, there was a, a treaty signed with Tripoli, the country of Tripoli, and here's a quote from that the, that treaty, quote, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, end quote. From the very, very beginning, the founding fathers said, no, this isn't a Christian nation. Now, to be fair, they were trying to sign a treaty with some Muslims, so it made it a little more advantageous for them to say that. But I think, I think they did still speak the truth. Another problem with Christians trying to create a Christian nation is that when Christians try to seek freedom for themselves by making laws accordingly, they often end up persecuting other people. And as an illustration of that, look at the Roman Empire. So for many, many years, the Roman Empire was on and off again persecuting Christians, or at least not didn't appreciate them very much. And then in... Um, 313, Constantine comes along and he says, it's going to be a Christian nation. And persecution stopped, Christians were happy, and everything was going to be good, right? Well, there were a lot of things that happened that were not good, but by the end of even Constantine's reign, he was taking away property of church groups that uh, to him were believing in uh, Donatism, which was, was a her- what he believed to be heretical. So he was already persecuting even other Christians or people who call themselves Christians because he didn't agree with them, even though he said this is going to be a Christian nation. People were forced to convert to Christianity. The church was corrupted, and it was the beginning of what we know as the Roman Catholic Church. And also the beginning of 1,000 years are called the Dark Ages. Another argument for Christians participating in government is Christians must defend their freedoms. Well, what did Jesus have to say about that? Defend their rights? Put the sword away? Peter tried to do it? In a, in a world where Jews resented having to carry the heavy backpacks a mile for the Roman soldiers, what did Jesus say? Take it two miles. Surely it's my right not to have to carry the government's backpacks. He said, go two miles. Some people argue, that, well, look at Paul. Didn't he use his rights as a Roman citizen to defend himself? And he did. It's true. But really, if you look at most New Testament Christians, they didn't do that. And I would have some reasons to believe that Paul's a little off track some of that time, and that could be a whole sermon in itself, so we can talk about that another time. But we don't see that as a pattern uh, for New Testament believers, for sure. 1 Peter 2.20, For what credit is there if when you sin you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. I don't see anything about defending your rights. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. We're supposed to suffer patiently. doesn't sound like fighting for our rights, fighting for our freedoms. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, I exhort you, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We should be praying that we could live in peace, pray that we could have freedoms, rights if you want to call them that but it doesn't say vote and campaign for them defend them and on a side note he says we're to thank god for all the leaders how long has it been since you thank god for president biden we all pray for him because we know we're supposed to do that but we're supposed to thank god for him too you done that lately i admit i hadn't until i read this verse another defense for 
Christians getting involved in politics is what some people call a flat Bible. Who can describe to me what Christians who believe in a flat Bible is? It's not flat earth. Old Testament and New Testament are equal. We don't differentiate between the laws of the old and the laws of the new. So I guess we should be stoning our children when they're Under rebellion, but against that's against the law, so we can't do that. But maybe we could. But I've heard that. I've heard a man say that. And you know, him. most most Christians, professing Christians today, would say that we believe in a flat Bible. Abraham and David and Solomon and Jesus and Paul all would be equally good examples for our Christian life to live today. It is absolutely indefensible when you read the New Testament and they say, you know, look, many of the Old Testament saints were involved in government. They fought to defend their rights. They fought for God. Jesus just makes it abundant. And and besides being incredibly inconsistent because they only apply it to the convenient parts of the Old Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 38, you have said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles the same? I think he makes it abundantly clear. There's a difference. And while there are many, many lessons we can learn from Old Testament saints, the Old Testament is not a guide for our life today. The example of David and all the saints in the Old Testament, Abraham who fought in wars, and um, is, not, is not for us today. If we look at the... the, the um, the New Testament doesn't talk as much about government probably as it does as the Old Testament does. But if you look at the book of Revelation, how does how does that story of the future, that prophecy of the future, how does it describe governments? You can tell me what's the most common depiction of governments in 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 the in Revelation? What kind of beasts? Friendly furry teddy bears? awful, evil, horrible looking beast. It seems like John just struggles to even describe how awful and corrupt these beasts are. And if we think that us joining into the beast can make it a better beast, we're fooling ourselves. What about Revelation? What about Revelation? Does Revelation say about kings? Anyone Tell me a little bit about what it says about kings. Mm-hmm. That's the judgment of them. What about during, <clears throat> during you know, before the judgment? And that, that's a good point because that, that's an indicator. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And that's Jesus. Revelation 16, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, we have a beast, and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Is that something that Christians can be participating in? Do we think that we're going to fare any differently just because we are Christians? Think we won't be deceived if we get caught up in that? Afraid not. As we come to conclusion, 
I'd like to just look at a few side notes that I think shed a little bit of light on what God thinks about government, what God expects of us. If we look at the New Testament, the whole Bible really, what form of government is the best? So we live in the United States, the greatest democracy ever in the history of the world. What does God say about form of government? It's a little inconvenient for us. Make sure and count the votes accurately. Monarchy? Or at least theocracy? Some of, some of both, perhaps. But we have nothing about representative government and uh, our, our, we're endowed by our creator by these inalienable rights and government of the people, f- by the people and for the people. And um, they derive the, the right to govern from the people that are got from the consent of the governed. We don't have any of that. And I don't know that, that, that we need to do a lot about that because we're not to be involved in government. But... And there are many good things about democracy that I appreciate, we appreciate, and we benefit from. But I'm afraid that we've become so accustomed to the, to the, the blessings of a, of a democracy that we lose sight of the way that God sets up government, church, and his kingdom, and in the world, because we're so enamored by democracy. I found an interesting quote by Margaret Thatcher wouldn't have thought that that'd be someone I would quote very often. She said, nowhere in the Bible is the word democracy mentioned. Ideally, when Christians meet as Christians to take counsel together, their purpose is not or should not be to ascertain the mind of the majority, but what is the mind of the Holy Spirit? Something which may be quite different. I think if we understand that, it will really affect the way church is operated. And I hope that if the majority is filled with the Holy Spirit, the opinion of the majority will be the same as the Holy Spirit, but it changes a lot of things. And that if my voice isn't heard or people don't appreciate or things don't go the way I wanted, that's less important than did we listen to the Holy Spirit. Another thing as we look at the world around us and how we should relate to it, Jesus' disciples got it. Apparently, they were following the local news too. And they got excited about this. And Jesus had a commentary on that. Luke 13. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans. I guess maybe it wasn't necessarily his disciples. Someone mentioned this. Whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So apparently, these Pilate had mixed the blood with their sacrifices and he had the authority to do this because he was the Roman ruler. And they were very upset about this, apparently. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He was not that concerned about the things and the news that worried the other people. Psalm 22, 8, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over all nations. And I think if we can keep that in mind, that the kingdom we're part of and all the kingdoms of the world are really God's. Satan has a certain amount of control over them now, but we are part of the Lord's kingdom, and the Lord's in control of all of this. And his, his purposes will be accomplished. Let's keep that in mind. Next month, we're going to look at the Christian and the government today. What does this mean for us? How do we put this into practice in everyday shoe leather? And I want to spend some time looking at Christians throughout history and how they walked out some of these ideas, the consequences of some Christians who thought they could do good in government, and look at the results. 
So I want to challenge you. Take a look at your involvement in government and see if it aligns with what the New Testament says. God bless you.